right, ready to go when you are. We ready? Yeah. Oh, here's Urs. Here's Ursula. Yeah. Um, hey, team, it's Steve uh, with the first of, I hope, several presentations that I'm going to deliver to you. Come on, you're good. I'm sorry. Be ready to no, start. start you want to start again? It's, oh, it's okay. right. You can start again, right. and then we'll just cut that out. Hey, team, it's Steve. Um, just, just start it from right here. So I'm okay. good. Hey team, it's Steve. Uh, I'm so excited to have this presentation uh, finished that Ursula and her team did a great job on, uh, and I think it's one of many that you're going to get that I think will really help you differentiate yourself in the field, and one that's going to allow you to go and talk about some things candidly that are interactive and exciting and fun, and candidly at the end of the day, the most important, they're very, very effective. So we've combined a couple of things that I've done over the years to help you uh, really have a good story, and so I want to walk you through uh, the way I would set these slides up, what the importance of the slide is, but I want to urge you to do this in your own voice, your own way. And one of the things that I always do is I look at a slide literally sometimes for 10 minutes and try to determine what's a story here, how can I equate it to my life, how can I, how can I think of a story that would be relevant to the audience that will really drive this point home. So as we go to the first slide, the way you set this up is we're going to talk about us. We're going to talk about human behavior, fears that we have, issues that we have, and candidly biases that we have that make us not very good at this investing thing. Uh, and we're gonna talk anecdotally about how that happens and the effect it can have in your portfolio. We're gonna transition to research insights and things about kind of academic framework, if you will, around the research that we've done on systematic withdrawals, on, on sequence of returns and things like that to show you how if you add our, our perceptions from a behavioral standpoint and you add it to add the academic work that's been done on responsible investing, the challenges that those two things, the conflict that exists. And then the third part hopefully is to introduce you to some of the tools and things that acts, with AXA that'll allow you uh, to solve the problems that we naturally have. So let's move to the first part, which is human behavior. And I always try to make this interactive. And as you go to the first slide, this is how I always set it up. I always say, let's assume that today is a great day and I'm gonna give you one of two choices. The first one is that I'll give everybody in this room a check for $3,000. And the second one is I'll give everybody in this room an 80% chance that they're gonna get $4,000, which are really, really good odds. So. Given those two choices, how many of you in the room want the $3,000? And what you will see 100 times out of 100 is that eight out of 10 hands are gonna go up. 80% of the people are gonna say, I want the $3,000, even though the odds of winning more money is, specific, is significantly higher. So what you draw from that is that people want the guaranteed income. Think about all the things we've heard as kids, a bird in the hand, those kind of things is what you wanna draw people to, to go, oh yeah, I remember that. So, even though I have a chance of making more money, I want the $3,000, so I want the guarantee, which as you know, and you can probably understand, that's critical for us later on. Now you go to the second slide, and what I always say is, now, let's assume that I shut these doors and you could not get out unless you chose one of two options. The first one is, you're gonna write me a check for $3,000. The second one is, that there's an 80% chance that the only way you're getting out of this room is by writing me a check for $4,000, but there's a slight chance that you actually can get away without writing me a check at all. So horrible, horrible odds, but how many people are gonna write me a check for $3,000 knowing that that's the likelier choice and the smarter choice? Almost always, no hands will go up. So what that's telling you is, in this study, that 92% of the people said, I'll take a chance, even though the odds are horrible, of writing you a check for $4,000 because there's a slight chance I'll have to write you nothing. And the reality is, what you take away from that is, I want the guaranteed income, as we discussed in the first slide, and I will do anything, including making really bad decisions, to avoid a loss really important for what we talk about and things that people need to know about our products as they think about themselves. So let's go to the next slide, and this talks about choice. Oftentimes people say, and you see it a lot of times for distributors, they say we have 3,000 mutual funds, 5,000 mutual funds, we've got all these things, and what you gotta remember is that's daunting for somebody who doesn't normally spend time in, in the investment world. I don't know what all this choice means. You can see it in 401k participation. The more choices you have, the less people participate. This is a really simple study that actually had a couple people in a grocery store. 
selling jam. And one person had a table that had six jams, and the other person had a table where they had 24 different si cases of jam, which is unbelievable to me. Like, how many could you possibly have? But what you'll see here is that percentages of people who tried both, so went up and said, I want to go to the one with six, the one with 24, more people went to the one with 24 because, you know, there's all these different concoctions and they were interested in it. But when it came time to purchasing, what you can see here is that 30% actually bought from the place that only had six. I can actually understand and, and get the differences between six. Very few people actually bought one when there was 24. So a lot of times you'll have people say, I really like your product, but I wish you had this fun family, this and this and that. And what you need to remind them is that more does not mean better. Oftentimes more is the inverse. It means it's overwhelming, there's too many choices. And I think about that in some of our contracts that have an awful lot of mutual funds. So understand that more choices actually is a deterrent for good investor behavior. Let's go to the next slide. Again, talking about how we actually get information. Let's go, and can you pull this one up? So this is an interesting thing I saw years ago where it's actually talking about people that went to a horse race. So again, when you're talking about this in a group, just have fun with this, right? Learn the slides, go through it. But these are people that actually went to horse races that were odds makers, that were looking at, you know, okay, I've got information on a horse. And what you'll see is that if I had five, you know, six or seven pieces of information on a horse versus, you know, versus a significantly higher number, the more information I got, pieces of information, the more confidence I got. Because I thought, okay, I really know. I've now got 25 pieces of information on this horse. I know everything about this horse. My confidence is way up. My accuracy actually went down, right? And, and I'll tell you where this happens. A lot of times you see people that go to seminars, they go to every seminar, they take a meeting with every single person, they never make a decision because of this. They think, okay, I've got all this, I've seen all these different people talk about this, I'm gonna get all this information, read all this, their accuracy goes down, and it's typical analysis paralysis. So more choice leads to more confidence, but actually poor investing. Let's go to the next slide. So the other thing to do is to think about how much harder it is to absorb a loss than it feels good to actually have a gain, right? And it sounds a little crazy until you break it down into something that, that people can understand. So I'm not a gambler, right? In fact, I, I just, I, I've never understood the gambling thing at all. And I'll tell you why. I could sit down at a blackjack table and I put $20 down and I win $20 it's just okay. But when that dealer, after I've just had a couple of cards not go my way, takes that $20 from me, it is legitimately like pulling it out of my flesh. Because that was not $20 worth of fun that I had there. And you can extrapolate that story out any way that you want, but losing money is feels a lot worse than making money. And oftentimes in our business, what you'll find is somebody saying, well, you know, the market's up 24%, so of course I'm gonna be up. But when you're down, that's when it really gets hard for investment advisors, the people that we work with, they really need to understand that this is part of the reason why. When it's down, your phone's gonna ring off the hook. The phone doesn't ring off the hook when their account's up with thank yous, it just doesn't. So we've got to avoid the pain. And as we saw earlier, people are gonna make stupid decisions to avoid a loss, just like I showed you earlier uh, in that experiment at the front end of this presentation got to understand that it may not be academically, you know, it may not make sense some of the things like annuities, guarantees, and all that to people who don't sell our product. Got to bring this home. Your clients are not going to understand loss. They're going to be hurting from loss, and they'll do anything to avoid a loss. Let me tell you what we do at AXA. Next slide. Okay, this one you have to really understand, and this is really relevant for the times that we've had the past several years where the market's up. This is gonna show you the MSCI World Index 2016 gave us an 8.15% return, which is great. And if somebody talked to their investment advisor on January 2nd and didn't talk to him again until December 31st and said, man, I never look at my statement, how'd I do? And the advisor says, you made 8.15%, they say, great, all right? Show the slides if you can. But that's not how 2016 happened. If I read my statement in January, I'm calling, I'm saying, oh, I'm, I, you know, we're down 6% in one month. I think, I think you know, this is a bad thing. Are we having another 2008? And then we're down again in February. Again, I'm really, really challenged. Okay, now I'm back. Now I'm back in March. Now I'm back for a couple months, a slight downturn. 
The problem is I look at my statements, I look at the you know my account online, however I get my information, I don't see it from January to December. I see what it did in January, in February, in the explicit months, and that affects my behavior. And the reason you have to know that is for the next slide. How I experience my investment returns actually informs how I will invest in the first place, believe it or not. So what this is telling you is that the amount of negative reports that an investor gets or an investment advisor has to take calls on, quite frankly, it monthly, four out of my, four out of my 10 statements are negative. And if I have four out of my 10 statements that are negative, the most I'm going to put in equity is 41%. So 59% of my money is going out of bonds if I going into bonds if I get my returns and look at them monthly. If I only did annual, one out of seven of my reports is negative, which means that 70% of my money is in equity. And I'm gonna give you a really, really important word that you need to talk to people about, and that word is can't. Very few people in our in our you know situations, in, in any financial situation, can put 41% of their money in equity and expect to live in a 30-year retirement, a 40-year retirement, depending on how old they are, 50 years. Very few people can do that. In fact, the, the vast majority of people that we serve have to be at least here. So how often if I see negative reports is gonna affect my asset allocation, believe it or not. That's another reason why guarantees and things like buffered annuities and all that will really help. If I have downside protection, I will invest more appropriately for what I need to do. And again, I can't urge you enough to use that word can't. I used to say it all the time. You can't do that and live the retirement that you want. You might be able to do this, but the only way you're gonna do this emotionally is if you have something in there that stops the loss. Let me tell you what we can do at AXA. Let's go to the next slide. Now the reason again that this is so critical about all the monthly reports and negatives and all the things that we've talked about is because people act irrationally. Right? In fact, this was the actual word that Greenspan used in the late 90s was that we were experiencing a time of irrational exuberance with the tech bubble. And again, people lost accounts up here by being up 25%. I remember it vividly, walking into the meetings, they're saying, I'm losing, I'm losing clients that are up 24% because their neighbor was up 162% buying Munder Net Net or buying some technology stock that their brother-in-law told them about. At the same time, we're never going to have oil prices go up again, right? So new economy was the word we used back there. So everybody wants to go into GetRich.com. Nobody's going into defensive things, energy, things of that nature, because the world is different this time. Fast forward just a few months later, here's March of 2000, and all of a sudden, I revert to the mean. And the reversion to the mean is more painful, as we just saw, than the euphoria that I felt on the upswing because I thought I was rich and now all of a sudden I've been rationalized. What are we seeing now that people are doing right now, right? All this Bitcoin and all these things right now, that's the new EMC or the new Google or Yahoo back at the period of time where people are like, no, 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 this is a new currency, new, and then all of a sudden what happens? This happens time and time again because we're euphoric or all of a sudden we're like completely devastated. We're like entrepreneurs in that way. And then all of a sudden, if you go back for just a second, can you go back to the slide? All of a sudden, out here where oil prices went straight up. That's why asset allocation is so critical. Okay, now you can advance it. So again, now what we're seeing, so this is like, you'd think we'd learn our lesson. 2000 to 2002 was brutal, and you know we can't just go into one sector. And now here's what's happening again. Indexes are up again. Now it's all about technology, new technology. I just mentioned Bitcoin. You can choose a stock that you like. And I have a, an actual example. I bought a stock EMC, which I bought it at $8 and it went to about 105. And I remember my advisor is a good friend of mine calling me saying, Hey man, you probably ought to sell some of those stocks because you know, you've made, you know, a hundred dollars on these things. And I'm like, ah, I don't want to pay taxes. And you know what? I never did because it went to six, right? So use a story like that that actually shows that even us as professionals do things like this all the time. So have we learned anything? And the answer is probably not. So how do I think about risk? Risk does precisely the same thing. I don't want to take any risk when the market's up, or I'm sorry, when the market's down, and I want to take it all when the market's high. Does that sound familiar right now where people are talking about, I just want, this thing's gonna keep going, keep going, keep going. We know that it's not, and we can show them that it's not. So my risk 
went up during the long term, uh, the, the Russian default back in uh, the late 90s. It went up, right, when we had the technology burst. It obviously went up for 9 11. My risk aversion was significant. I didn't want to do anything that took risk. And all of a sudden, I take less, I'm not as worried about risk anymore. Things are normalizing, right? The tech bubble has kind of reversed itself. I'm starting to make a little bit more money. I feel good about myself. And by the way, the economy's doing really well. Have you seen housing? It's easy to get a house. Look at the housing prices, driving the market, driving the market. And we all know what happens next, right? The same euphoria that got me there. Now, here's where my risk aversion was during the financial crisis, off the charts, because trust was lost, right? So you've got technology that was just irrational exuberance, and now you have all of a sudden the credit crisis and nobody trusts anybody. Counterparty risk, I don't wanna give my money to anybody, I don't know who's gonna be stable, who's not gonna be stable. And if you think about it, the difference between the bottom of the tech bubble, 2002, and the beginning of the financial crisis was five years. So it's not like it's 50 years ago that this happened. It's not like let's compare the Great Depression to 1999. It was five years. So we do not learn our lessons as people very well and very quickly, right? So go to the next slide, if you will. And let's talk a little bit about the net result of all this. I want to guarantee I'll do anything to avoid a loss. Loss hurts. I don't like a lot of choice, and if I did like a lot of choice, it's going to make me less accurate and kind of summarize everything that we went through. I'm going to do bad things to my portfolio based on my emotions, period. And the reason that this is important is because the S&P averaged 7.68, the equity funds 4.79, the average investor 2.3. The average investor barely beats inflation. Right? And if you take taxes out of that, they might as well just throw their money out the window. It is our job to point these things out to them to show them how we can help them and what the, what the experiences are when you have the kinds of things that we can provide. I mean, I can tell you, I, you've all heard my Enron story. I can tell you that sitting down with people that thought they lost everything and being able to tell them, you're fine. And you're fine forever is a really, really important thing that we need to make sure that we're telling people. Even if you, oh, I don't do annuities, I don't do this. You've got to educate them on these kinds of things and let them know the returns here, the returns. Forget about the fees and annuities and things like that. The returns are going to be better. The outcome for the client is going to be better, and that's what we do at AXA. Okay, so can you click on these things? So the most important thing we can do, and if you think about our business like this, in the 403B business and in the 401K business, clearly 457 as well, we have an opportunity when we're, talking to, when we're talking to young people to explain this in such a way that says you've got to remember that if you're 25 years old, you're going to need this money for 60, 65 years. That's how long it is. And making little incremental changes to your portfolio right now. And think about so many of our people going into GEO right now that's paying 175 or 150 in all of our businesses. We're not necessarily doing them any favors. What we need to do is have the tough, tough conversations, talk about behavior, talk about buffered annuities and guarantees and things like that. Because here's what happens. As a young person, even saving an extra 1% a year, just 1%, by the time they hit retirement, they have an additional $220,000, and that equates to more than 10 years in spending. So when you have the opportunity to sit down with RBG or sit down with your advisors that are talking to the corporate markets, they've got a lot of young employees, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna help the older employees and people kind of in their midlife by talking about the things that we talked about earlier in terms of using SIO, using PIB where applicable, but importantly for these younger people, get them out of the stuff that's not gonna make them any money and show them why. Don't let them paint themselves in that bucket of being conservative and remind them that their pension isn't gonna be necessarily enough. They've got to have other things and we can help them. Okay, let's go into research insights and this is sort of nerdy and I'm gonna explain where you make the, you know, where you translate this into what actually happens, but let's think about it this way. Most of the research that I have here is from Alliance Bernstein, right? So the Bernstein private wealth management side. Now they're only dealing with clients with multiple millions and millions of dollars. And so I had a chance to do this for a number of years as I ran the offices in Texas, in Dallas, and it was really important to see how people could understand, okay, how much money am I gonna lose? or how much money can I take out of my account? And they could really, we used to say, pre-experience what it's like to invest with us uh, so that they could understand, am I risky, am I not risky, and how much money should I 
uh, invest and should I invest where? So I'm gonna walk you through some of this and we'll talk about this more uh, out in the field, hopefully when I get out there. But let's start with some basic data. 68% of people are confident they will have adequate income in retirement, but yet 68% of workers have accumulated less than $50,000 for retirement. So I'm confident, but really for not any reasons based on academics, right? 86% expect they, they would need an income replacement of 70% or less, which is absolutely not the case. In fact, what you'll find a lot of times with people that retire, their spending goes up in the first several years because the way I always tell people is, do you spend more money on Tuesday or do you spend more money on Saturday? Spend more money on Saturday, right? Because that's the day you go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, you go take your kids to the bar, you do whatever, you just spend more money. That's retirement, it's just a constant Saturday, if you do it right, right? So this is not academically sound. 42% have done a retirement needs calculation and 8% of those just guessed at what they would need. And I would tell you, I'm surprised that that, that, that number is, is that low because normally I see people that I think I'll need X amount that have not even done it yet. So sometimes we think about, well, of course you're gonna do a retirement plan. Remember, most people have not done the basic simple thing. It's so critical and so important to remind people that's what we do with teachers every single day. That's what we do with corporate employees every single day is do a plan. All right, 61% of people think they have a pension. And, I, and I've seen this in real life and only 40% actually have access to such a plan. And in our world in the teacher market, even if they have a pension, as you know, oftentimes they say, well, I'll be fine because I have a pension. They don't know that that pension is only going to replace 30 to 60% of their income, which is not enough, right? But people just think, I, I think the 401k means that I'm going to, I get income in retirement. They don't know. Nobody pays attention to this, right? That's why it's so important that we bring it to their attention. All right, so let's take a basic, uh, basic planning option here, which is a million dollar retirement, qualified investment, uh, for a 65-year-old couple, and as we know, for a 65-year-old couple, there's a 10% chance, or a 65-year-old person, there's a 10% chance they're still going to be alive at 95. If they're married, there's a 25% chance that one of them is going to be alive at 95. So this idea that, oh, I'm never going to make it that long, and you know, oftentimes you get into somebody going, oh, you know, nobody lived that long on my side of the family, and I'm going to die. You can't do that, right? Medical reasons, all that, it doesn't matter. You have to plan that you're going to live 95 years old. All right, no other sources of income. This is their million dollars, this is all they have. All right, and they use, as I said, the WFS, the Wealth Forecasting System from AB, which takes, 10, takes into account 10,000 plausible capital markets returns. It's incredibly robust, and it'll show them what their odds are of success in certain scenarios. Okay, so what I've done here is I have a conservative portfolio, and you can look at this later, 20% stocks, 80% bonds, all the way up to more of an aggressive portfolio, which is an 80-20. All right, and I basically ran this through the scenario multiple times so you can see what it looks like over different time frames and with different withdrawals. So the first thing we have to understand, and what again, some of this may seem elementary to you, but I'm telling you, you gotta keep reinforcing and reinforcing, which is taking out a four, four and a half, five, six, or seven percent withdrawal means that I might start out with that million dollars somewhere at the you know forty thousand dollars, but out 30 years. So for, again, let's go back to the numbers. I'm 95 years old and I need $40,000 of income that I got back here in 2018. That means I'm taking out $94,000 a year. So that's taking your initial 40 and only increasing it by inflation, right? Somebody who's taken out a 7% withdrawal needs $164,000 a year. $70,000, you need $164,000 of spending 30 years out to buy the same thing. So. A lot of times you hear where inflation has not been that big of a deal, inflation is still very much a predator in our portfolio. Okay, go ahead. So here's the reality, the harsh truth behind all this, which is take out 20 years, remember those portfolio options that I gave you from 2080 all the way to 8020, all right, and I'm going to take out a 6% withdrawal rate, and believe it or not, there's still an awful lot of people out there that tell you, well, this portfolio has averaged 6%. So you can take out a 6% return, which is absolutely not the right advice, right? You cannot tell somebody that, you know, why do we have past performance is not the, not the you know, there's no guarantee of past performance all over our stuff because it's true. So if I took out 6%, running it through the Bernstein analysis, look at these bottom numbers in blue. Conservative portfolio, 58% chance of failure. Aggressive portfolio, 25% chance of failure. 
with a 6% withdrawal, okay? So the reality of it is that this isn't good enough, right? What we used to tell people is we wanna plan for a 90% chance of success. So over 20 years, taking out a 6% 6 of my account value every single year means that I'm probably gonna fail. But if I'm that person that made it to 65 and I live another 10 more years, go to the next one please, I fail. Guaranteed failure. 88% failure, 71% failure, and 58% failure. This is less optimal than a coin flip. If I live 30 years and I take out 6%, I'm gonna fail. And that's what you need to remind people. Now, let's go to the next slide. What if I did 4.5%? I cut it back a little bit, right? Better, okay, but still, conservative, 61%. Now, 39% chance of failure, if I have 40% in stocks. Do you remember a few minutes ago, I showed you that if you got monthly returns, you only put 40% of your money in stocks? This is bringing the research back to it. Remember when I used that word can't? 40% stocks, because I'm scared, I saw monthly returns, means a 40% chance of failure. That's why you can't do it. So why are you so reluctant to put money in equities? I don't wanna lose money, I don't wanna lose money. We're gonna be able to help them with that in a few minutes. 80% stocks, 20% bonds, went from a 25% failure to 24% chance of failure. People oftentimes are, free, are, are can't believe that. It's only 4.5%. It's a 4.5% withdrawal on your portfolio, and it's, and it's not going to work if you live 30 years in most cases. And again, this is kind of that tough love that you give to people to say, I'm not making this up to sell you something. This is from a company that, would, that doesn't even sell annuities. Right? This is what they're telling you what, you know, what your options are. Let's go to the next one. Now here's another thing. A lot of times people say, well, I'm too conservative or I'm, or I'm, I'm aggressive. And I used to see this all the time. People say, well, I'm, I'm an aggressive investor. I'd say, okay, you can go 80%, you know, 20% bonds, 80% stocks, 20% bonds. Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty aggressive. There's a 35% chance that you're going to have a year where you lose 30%. So let me just put that in the numbers. There is a high probability that you're gonna have a chance or have a year where you lose $300,000. And everybody goes, okay, never mind, I'm not aggressive. I'm not aggressive. What about a 20% loss? Well, that aggressive investor, there's a 73% chance it's gonna happen. Okay? So now I'm going, all right, I know that if I see monthly returns, I put money 40% in stock, 40% only in stock. I'm not gonna make it because it's too big of a withdrawal, right? And, I'm, and now I can't do that. And if I'm scared to death to lose money, right? I'm gonna have this significant loss here, which is gonna be painful for me, right? I've got all these challenges here that says I can't invest aggressively like I want to because I'm gonna lose money and I'm not comfortable with that. If I see monthly statements and it's gonna make me, then it's gonna make me do negative things. Do you see where the behavior and the academics come together and say we have a real problem? That's the point that you need to get across. Let's go to the next one. So now let's take a look at something that we can live with here, which talks about uh, initial withdrawals of 4%, okay? A 4% withdrawal and how much money I'll have in different markets. And the way to read this chart is, I started with a million dollars. If the market just crushed it every single year for 30 years, I'd end up with $7 million, all right? If it was a median market, I'd end up with 1.8. But if it was a terrible market, then I could run out of money, but there's only a 13% chance of failure with a 4% withdrawal. 7% withdrawal, forget it. 6% withdrawal, forget it. 5% withdrawal, forget it, right? You cannot plan that, you know, have a 40% chance that you're not gonna lose all your money. Now we're getting somewhere. Now I can talk to somebody about a 4% withdrawal, right? That you've got a real prob a high probability of living for the rest of your life and having the, the retirement that you want. Median case, you end up fine. Great case, you end up incredibly well. But this is the kind of stuff that we do. We talk to you about how to asset allocate and taking out a responsible withdrawal. So let's go to the next page. So now we got to take a look at the sequence of returns, right? We haven't even talked about that, and you know that. So now I've said, okay, I'm going to take a responsible withdrawal out. But what if I take it out at the wrong time? So this is showing me a 5% annual withdrawal. I've got inflation in here, but you can look at these again. I don't know how well you'll be able to see it on the screen, but the red line shows a 7% constant, which is crazy. That's not gonna happen. 
Another one shows you still get to 7%, but you start off losing 13. Well, now I'm broke at 90. How about if I start off losing 13 after I had a 7% year, I'm broke again. Look at the amount of times that I end up losing my money at age 95, just by taking it out of the time that I, I had no idea. I just retired in you know, September of 2008. Guess what? I'm back to work, okay? So I've got to allocate appropriately. I've got to take into effect, into effect that my clients are going to react negatively to pain, and I have no idea what the market's going to be doing during this period of time. Do we have enough challenges? Oh, and by the way, I'm really going to be bad at this just in general just because of my DNA. Let's go to the next page. The good news is that we can help you, all right? As I thought you might believe at the beginning that I would come back to, hey, here's what we're going to do. But if you go to the first page, go to the next slide, this is where you talk about to the teachers and to the people in the 457 plans, our public employees, about semester funds. And what you explain to them very briefly is the challenges that we have from a behavioral perspective, the issues academically that that can cause for us, and the solution is I've got a guaranteed account. It's going to pay you a slight little bit of interest, but it's there for you if you need it. And I've also got the ability to help you avoid that pain of loss that you feel, that pain that you feel deep down because I have this buffered annuity that's going to take a percentage of the downside out of your, out of your life and not make you worry about it because AXA is going to be here to absorb that loss. And I'm going to invest you appropriately. As we saw earlier, you got to have more equities than maybe you were comfortable with to live for 30 years in retirement. This combination gets you to that 70, 80% allocation that you need to keep up with inflation and continue to be an, a, a responsible investor without having to feel the pain. Go to the next slide, sorry. Now, let me explain how this works. We are gonna give you a percentage of the upside based on you know, what we call caps. What that means is how much we're gonna give you at the time in terms of your upside. But right now, over this five year time period, we're gonna give you 35% of the upside of the S&P 500. So if the market did 19% as an example, you get all of it. We're also going to cap your downside. We're going to take the first 20% downside and you're not going to feel that. So if the market's down 15%, guess what? You made you didn't go down at all. You're at zero. Now, what if the market just crushed it and after 5 years it was up 40%? Well, you got 35% of that. What if the market got crushed and went down 22%? You only lost two. So all of the things that make us poor investors, right? Fear of loss, challenges, the way I experience you know, information and what it makes me do as an investor, and it won't, make me, it won't allow me to invest appropriately, can be solved in this chart. You get the upside that you need, the downside that you want. Remember that $3,000 I gave you at the beginning? You get the $3,000 and you get the chance to get the $4,000. Bring it all back to the slides that we talked about. Now, this is just math, okay? This is just simple math. I really want you to understand this about, about PIB, right? And PIB, probably, you don't start talking about that till 50 or 55. But again, what you gotta look at it is PIB is a fixed income guaranteed, a, new, a fixed amount of money that you're gonna have that you can take out as income in your life, right? I always used to tell people that this is a place for you to actually supplement your, your, your uh, fixed income. Sorry. This is what you want to do maybe instead of bonds or instead of a portion of your bonds. Because as we look at the outlook on fixed income, it's not awesome. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. But here's what PIB will get you, again, depending on the age that you're at, but let's assume it's a 5%. $10,000 investment, you're guaranteed to have $15,000 at the end of 10 years that you can take as an income stream, right? Always need to disclose that. And that $15,000 will pay you $750 for the rest of your life. I know you understand that. What would I have to get in bonds to get this same $750? I'd have that, that bond would have to grow in 10 years to $18,775, which is a 6.5% annual return. There isn't anyone who is predicting that bonds are gonna average 6.5%. It is half that at best. So why would you do that? If you want bonds for income and you want it to supplement your retirement, and I know that I'm guaranteed this, why in the world would I risk it 
right, to try to get that same amount of money. You just saw earlier that 80% of the people want the guarantee. They want it. That's what 80% of the people want. So don't put them in an impossible position to tell them that bonds are going to get 6.5%. Give them the same income without ever having to worry about it. That's what people want. Let's give them what they need, but also in a chassis of what they want. The other thing that's important, and this is a Kevin Kennedy thing I thought was interesting, is the difference between 4 and 5% isn't 1%. It's 20%. You get 20% more income with us than you would if you just took a 4% out of, an, out of an account, right? So don't think about four and five as 1%. Think about it as 20% more income that we are guaranteeing you in retirement. Okay, go to the last one. So again, I'll just go back to this. Look at, this is Bernstein's analysis in terms of their forecast. Core bonds are gonna average 2.7%. And what did I tell you in the earlier page? Six and a half is what you have to get to match PIB. It's, it's less than half. Less than half is their forecast. Equities, 5.9. What are the caps right now? Are they higher than 5.9? They are. So again, we are not gonna deal in terms of here's what we think, here's what we believe, here's what our analysts say. What we're gonna say is, here's what I know, here's what I promise, and here's what I guarantee. And which words would you rather have somebody say when they're talking about your retirement income? So, in closing, what I wanted to do is to talk about, don't forget about, for your older clients, adding PIB in here for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Take part of that fixed income and put them in PIB and get them invested appropriately. Use SIO as a buffered annuity into the, you know, the S&P 500, the Russell, and the EFA, and then round it out with equity. We're gonna make this simple for you when we build semester funds, but for now, why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't you do this? This is what people want, and this is what they need and we're gonna deliver it for them. So I hope you have fun with this. I hope you learn a lot and go through and determine and make this thing your own and go out and deliver it to everybody and shorten it where you need to, but just have a good time with this because you know what? It's actually just right. It's academically sound and it makes a lot of sense for people and it'll help, help our clients do the right thing in retirement. So thanks very much. That was great. Yeah, there are awesome. a you lot were, of places. What? You're just gonna be critical. No, that was really good. Really Nailed good. It. Yeah. And where did you time out at? 41 minutes? He started a little after the mm -hmm. beginning, so <clears throat> just over 30. 30. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Because yeah. when we break it down for the modular, there's yeah. really three sections. Right. So that they can just give us a... I love that you use two cones. Yeah. Thank you. Two angles. For doing that. Two angles for it. <laughs> no, yeah, that was I think that they're was really... Awesome. Steve, they're just going to be able to see the slide and hear you, which I think is really their fear. You know, a few of them have seen the deck and it's just like,